at least I attempt to preach. How's that? Uh, it's so good to see you this morning. Uh, if you've got your Bibles, if you will, open them up. Believe it or not, we will be our last week in Mark chapter 1 after, <laughs> after weeks. I hope you enjoy walking through a book of the Bible like this slowly. You know, I'm under the conviction that so often we try to preach through the Word so quickly that people don't get a good grasp of it. And I believe in preaching the whole counsel of God's Word. And when you walk slowly through a book or a passage of Scripture, I, I really believe it helps our folks to get a better grasp of it. And so I hope you enjoy that. Uh, but we're going to finish chapter 1 today. And the title of my message is Build Your Kingdom Here. A few weeks ago, uh, we were... Uh, I was sharing the words to a song that we sometimes sing and love to sing here at Shiloh. <coughs> and uh, the words go, build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Isn't that a good prayer? That song is a prayer. And, you know, after the events of yesterday, how tragic. It, I didn't realize what had happened. I, I, I kept seeing a little... Uh, something pop up on my phone about President Trump, but I was busy and I didn't pay it much attention. And so uh, last night, of course, the news was consumed with it and how tragic that we are at a place in our country where there's so much division, so much hatred, um, and we need, listen, there is only one way that we are going to get stronger and better and heal as a nation, and that is with God's help. And we must start there. And so today's <coughs> message um, is, some, is going to remind us of a few things that are very, very critical and important. If we're going to see God's kingdom here on earth, some things that we must see. But, but listen to these words. And, and as we, I want to go to the Lord in prayer. I want to, I want to pray for our nation this morning. I want to pray for uh, former President Trump. I want to pray for President Biden. I want to pray for all of our leaders I want to pray for us as a nation. And I want it to begin with us. You know, the Bible points that, that healing in a land and a nation begins with the people of God. It, it's when we begin to humble ourselves and see our need and be willing to repent of our sin and turn to God and sincerely and humbly ask for his help that we see him work and we see him move. And church, we've got to get back to that. Amen? So I'm going to read the words to this song, but I really want to pray them this morning. Can we do that? Would you join me in prayer? Our precious Heavenly Father, we come today. And Lord, we, we, we bow our hearts in your presence. You are our almighty God, our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, our holy God. And Lord, you are righteous in all of your ways. You are the perfect judge. Lord, you're the one who gave your son, the Lord Jesus, on our behalf to, to pay our sin debt. And we are forever grateful. And Lord, we come in your presence today to praise you. We come to give you thanks. Lord, we come to beseech your help. And Lord, as, we, as, as this song has been on my heart, all the more here in recent days. I want to pray, Lord, before you, the words to this, to this song. Lord, we ask that you would build your kingdom here. We need you to move and work in our lives, in our communities, in our schools. We need you to work and move in our state, in our state government, and on the local level. We need you to move and work uh, in our national government, Lord. We need you to work in, in nations around the world and in, and in leaders' hearts. Lord, build your kingdom here and let the darkness fear. God, we ask you to show your mighty hand. Lord, we ask you to heal our streets and our land. And Lord, set your church on fire and win this nation back. Father, we ask you to change the atmosphere. Government can't do it. Leaders can't do it. 
The wisdom of man can't do it. But Father, we pray through a work of your Holy Spirit that you would change the atmosphere and build your kingdom here, we pray. Father, we ask that you would come and set your rule and reign and increase in us, we pray. Unveil why we're made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. And Lord, we know with you there is plenty of hope. So Holy Spirit, we ask you to come and invade us now. We are your church. And we need your power in us. We seek your kingdom first. Lord, we hunger. We thirst. Help us refuse to waste our lives, for you are our joy and prize. To see the captive hearts released, the hurt, the sick, the poor at peace, we lay down our lives for heaven's cause. We are your church, and we pray, revive. Lord, build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Oh, we ask that you would heal our streets and our land, and that you would set your church on fire with revival and win this nation back. Change the atmosphere, we pray. Lord, we are never without hope when we look to you. So, Lord, we look to you in faith and in trust. And, Lord, we also know that revival begins when we humble ourselves and when we pray and when we seek your face and we repent of our sins. Lord, I pray that, that we would be desperate for you. Do a work in us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. And church, I would ask you all through the days ahead to, to pray, to find some time in your day to, um, to fast and to pray, maybe... Maybe take part of your lunch break. Maybe get up a few minutes early in the morning um, and, and, and focus your heart and attention on praying for this great nation and praying for all of us and praying for yourself and your families. Um, I believe God wants to do a work, and I know that uh, we need to pray that his kingdom would come. Today, as we come to the scripture, uh, we are going to see, uh, I believe, some things that are critical if we're going to see God work and move in our day, in our lives, for his kingdom to come on earth right where we are. And so I hope you'll watch as we read the scripture, beginning in Mark chapter 1 and verse 35 and following. Listen to God's word. The scripture says, now in the morning, and this is uh, speaking of Jesus here, now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. Verse 40 says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. And then Jesus, moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And as soon as he had spoken, immediately the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, 
show yourself to the priest and offer for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out and he began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. And so um, as we go back, I want to look at that scripture and I want us to notice a few things that, that are necessary for God's kingdom to come on earth. And, and the first thing we see is the priority of prayer. The priority of prayer. The scripture says in verse 35, Now in the morning, having risen, risen a long while before day, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And that was the habit of our Lord in his prayer life. Listen, he would get up before the sun came up. He would get up and he would, he would it was so important to spend time with his heavenly father. He would get up a long while before daylight and he would go out to a, a private place, a solitary place where he would pray. And that was Jesus, one of Jesus' habits. You know, even the psalmist mentioned this in Psalm chapter 5 and verse 3. And listen to what it says. My voice you shall hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning, I will direct it to you, and I, and I will look up. You know, what a wonderful way to begin your day, amen, to look up. You know, often we begin our day, and we're looking down, aren't we? We're looking down. We're down a little bit sad. We've got to go to work. We're a little bit sad, and we look at our to-do list and, and all the things we have to do, and it just kind of drags us down a little bit right out of bed. But what if we started our day by looking up and knowing that God is with us and wants to bless us and help us if we will look to Him and seek His wisdom and seek His blessing and seek His guidance. And that's what Jesus, He had a habit of spending time with His Heavenly Father. Now, I want you to notice there in the Scripture, and it says, while He, he went to that place, He went to that solitary place, where he prayed, so he spent time in fellowship with the Father. And then the scripture says, And Simon, that was Peter, and those who were with him searched for him. And when they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. You can almost hear a little bit of attitude in Peter's voice. Lord, there are people here in need of miracles. Where are you? You know, Peter was a little bit boisterous. Sometimes he would engage his mouth before he thought. Any, anybody ever do that? And so he said, everyone is looking for you. You know, it, it's, there's a powerful lesson in that scripture for all of us about the priority of prayer. Because someone will always have something else for you to do. I, I, had, a, I had a friend who uh, in recent years retired. Well, he didn't really retire. He just kind of regrouped. He stopped the job he was doing so he could focus on other things. And uh, I gave him a little bit of advice that I've heard through the years from others. I said, I said, my friend, I want you to know, once you retire, you need to set your agenda or other people will set it for you. If you don't decide what you're going to do in living your life, everyone else will be happy to tell you how to live your life. Isn't it true? Everybody always has something else for us to do. But dear believer, dear, dear believer in Christ, I want you to know that the most important thing that you can do on a daily basis is to find some time and spend it in the presence of your heavenly father and pray. That is the greatest work. When it comes to the work of the church, I love all of our ministries. Listen, we just had vacation at Bible school. We have a time. Dealt with Haley. It, and God blesses. But you know why God blesses? We seek his heart. We ask him to bless it. We spend time in prayer. And our teachers and all our workers spend time praying. Asking God to bless it. And God does an amazing work. Anything we begin to attempt to do as a church. And we don't sit in the Father's presence. And seek his blessing. And seek his uh, guidance. And, and seek his how, what he wants us to do, we're in trouble. And so Jesus always began. He began in that private place, in that solitary place with his heavenly 
father. Uh, my pastor growing up, Johnny Muller, uh, he had a son whose name was John. And uh, I remember, this was many years ago, John was just a, he was just a little fella. And I went over to Pastor Johnny's one afternoon. It was one afternoon during the week. And John came running out of the house and he came to see me. And he said, Glenn, I want to show you something. He was so excited. And so John took me and he started off, he went through the front yard and he headed off into the woods. And I thought, what in the world? Where are we going? And little John took me and there he went into the woods and he got to this little area and he had cleared out an area and he had a stump sitting there, there in the woods and he had a stump and he had made a wooden cross out of two sticks and he had stuck that cross up there in the ground and that was his little place that he made, that was his solitary place, that was his private place that he made specifically to go out and have his time with the Lord every day and pray because his daddy was teaching him to do those things. He was so excited about it. And so, so John had a habit as a little boy. He began to go out there and spend time in the presence of his heavenly father and pray. I want to tell you something. When a child begins to pray, you better watch out. Because I think they have a special tug on God's heart. John today, his father has passed and gone, gone home to be with Jesus a few, few years ago. But John, little John today, is about close to seven feet tall. He's not little John anymore. And John is a pastor of one of the largest churches in North Carolina with, that has multiple campuses. And he is one of the campus pastors for that church. And God is using him in a great, great way. They are seeing people come to know Jesus. They're seeing people baptized. And I want to tell you something. I believe that God's hand has been on that young man because he was a young man who would get along with his heavenly father. He knew what he needed to do. Church, I wonder if we understood the importance and the power of having a priority of prayer in our lives, how it would begin to impact not only our life, but the lives of our families, the lives of our friends, the lives of our workplace, the lives of our community, and yes, on into our, on into our state and our nation and, and impact the world. There is power in spending time in God's presence. You see, Jesus had... A habit of doing that. It was his place to spend time in the Father's presence. It was a place of restoration and fellowship with his Father. So rich was the Lord's prayer life that the disciples asked him to teach them to pray. They began to equate what they saw. They began to equate Jesus' miracles and the healing of the sick and his powerful teaching and preaching. They began to equate that with Jesus' time alone with his father, they wanted him to teach them how to pray, and he did. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed, holy is your name. And so he, he began to teach them to pray. But with, all through Jesus' life and ministry, we see that. Even, even upon Jesus' baptism today, we're going to the river and and listen, I'm excited because God has been doing the work at Shiloh. Have y'all noticed? Today at the river, we are going to baptize six people, potentially up to nine today. And if anyone else, if the Lord gets a hold of your heart today, you come see me. We'll baptize you too. Listen, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you've never been scripturally baptized, that is the first step of obedience we see in scripture. But why is that happening today? Why are six people being baptized today? Because God has been doing a work in their hearts. His kingdom is coming into their hearts. And, and they want to follow him in obedience. That is exciting. Amen. Jesus, when he was baptized, he was led into the desert for 40 days. 
He was in the desert and he was fasting and praying. And we know it was during that time that Satan tempted him. But Jesus, every time, would defeat the devil with the word of God. But Jesus also, after an exhausting day in ministry here in Mark 135, we, we see that he got up, he left the house, he went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And it was often when he would retreat, when he was in the midst of busy crowds that were seeking him and pulling, pulling at him, the scripture says in Luke chapter 5, but Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and he prayed. We see that in preparation for, for those times, and even before the Sermon on the, on the Mount, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray. And the scripture says he spent the whole night praying to God. When was the last time you spent the whole night praying? And when Jesus heard, um, when Jesus heard about John the Baptist being beheaded, the scripture says he withdrew by a boat privately to a solitary place. So when Jesus was hurting, he would go and he would pray. Before he fed the 5,000, Jesus said to his disciples, come with me by yourselves to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. Um, listen, that place of prayer, that, that place of sitting in the Father's presence is also a place of rest. If you find yourself worn out and tired and weary and frustrated and, and, and you just want to throw, throw in the towel, so to speak, my first suggestion with you, to you would be to get along with the Father and spend some time sitting in His presence. It's there we find refreshment. It's there we find peace. It's there we find hope. And so Jesus had a priority of prayer. One pastor said the priority of Jesus Solitude and silence is everywhere in the Gospels. It's how he began his ministry. It's how he made important decisions. It's how he dealt with troubling emotions like grief. It's how he dealt with the constant demands of his ministry. And he cared for his soul. It's how he prepared for his death on the cross. It was through times in his father's presence in prayer. Someone said, and now if the Lamb of God being holy... And we being unholy, should we have the need to be still and alone with God if God's Son needed it? Certainly we do. So ask yourself honestly, when was the last time you spent time, real time, <coughs> alone with God? Is that a habit you have in your life? If we want to see God's kingdom come, if we want to see God make a difference in our lives, in our homes, if we want to see God make a difference in your children's lives, in your grandchildren, in our schools, in our community, there must be a priority of prayer. I'm so thankful we live in a community. Do you know that there are schools in this community who invite me to come in and spend time with the teachers sometimes in the afternoon and do prayer walks? And any time they ask me to do it, I gladly do it. And it blesses me. And those are real times of prayer. And I, I dare to say our schools and our community is not perfect. But I think I'd rather live here than just about anywhere in the country. Because it's a special place. Amen. Because I believe we still have a people who love to pray. And who know that we need the Lord. The second thing that we find if, if God's kingdom is going to come, not just the priority of prayer, but we need, uh, we have a need for powerful preaching. Now, I'm not here to tell you that I'm a Billy Graham. I'm not. I do the best I can. God bless you. Help you. But I believe this. I believe any time someone gets up and sincerely opens the word of God and begins to read the word of God, the power of God and the power of the Holy Spirit takes that living word of God and finds its mark in the hearts of every person. 
You don't have to be the greatest preacher. If you're dealing with the living word of God and you're speaking it and you're preaching it and you're teaching it and you ask the Holy Spirit to help you, God does a work in the hearts of the people. We've got a team getting ready to go to Guatemala. And I'm not going with them this year. And, and uh, I shared with them this week that I... I, I Went over with them just a, a quick lesson on sharing the gospel and using the Evangel Cube, and, and I encouraged them to do it. I said, you don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be good at it. You don't have to follow a script or, or any of that. If you will go with the purpose of sharing the good news of the gospel and leaning on the Holy Spirit, God will do the work. He will. I've seen him do it time and again. I've been on the mission field when we started going to Brazil many, many years ago. I was just blown away. I shouldn't have been blown away. I should have known it. But I was just blown away when we would go into the favelas, into the slums, and we would go into these little shanty houses. I couldn't speak Portuguese. I was trying to do the best I could with an interpreter. And I would share with them my testimony and I would just begin to open the scripture and just share the, the, the word of God with them. I would share John 3.16 and I would share some of the Roman road for, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And I would begin to open the word and just share it. And, and I couldn't do much else because I didn't speak their language and I would see tears start to roll out of some of their eyes. And I would see the Holy Spirit begin to work and move in their hearts. And then we would call for an invitation. We would invite them to come to Christ. And they would. And I recognized that I was in the presence of a holy God who was doing the work. There is power in preaching the word of God. I want you to notice what Jesus did in verses 38 to 39. Remember, everybody had been looking for him. Peter said so. He had been in the presence of the Father. Don't forget that. He had been in the presence of the Father. And then, this is what the scripture said, verses 38 and 39. But he said to them, let us go into the next towns. That I may preach there also. And listen to what he said. Because for this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons. You see now apparently the crowds that were coming to Peter's house, they wanted more miracles. They wanted to see more miracles, but they weren't as quick to grasp the call to repent and believe the gospel. That wasn't on their spiritual radar. You know, like so many today, they wanted a Jesus to their liking. A Jesus who would perform miracles and fit into their agenda. We still like a Jesus to our own liking. I want a Jesus who loves me. I want a Jesus who will forgive my sins. I want a Jesus who will take me to heaven when I die. But listen, as far as living my life day to day, I'll handle that. Thank you very much. Who is God to tell me how to live my life? And so we like a Jesus after our own liking. But Jesus preached a message of repentance. And allowing God's kingdom to come in our heart. In other words, allowing him to be the Lord of our lives. The master of of our lives. And so Jesus went about from town to town and he was preaching. I was reading in one commentary and it said neither the crowds nor the disciples understood why he had come into the world, but he knew. Jesus came to preach, to herald, to proclaim the gospel of salvation. A message that is both by him and about him. Indeed, he is the gospel. But sadly, the crowd often, often misses him. God had only one son and he made him a preacher. No pastor is worthy of the office who does not preach the word. 
No church will prosper spiritually without the preaching of the word. Listen, church, I, I believe this. I, I'm, very, I'm very careful to guard my time preaching. Sometimes we get so much going at the church. There are so many announcements. We could spend 20 minutes doing announcements. And I say no. Because that cuts into the time of delivering the word. Announcements don't change men's hearts. God's word does. If you want to know what the announcements are, I love you, but they're in the bulletin. Amen? They're on the screens. We'll hit one or two that's pressing and important and we need you to know. But there is nothing that should take the place of the preaching of God's word because by it and the power of the Holy Spirit, men's lives are changed and see their need for a Savior. John Stott said Christianity in its very essence is a religion of the word of God. Martin Luther said, let us consider it certain and conclusively establish that the soul can do without all things except the word of God. And that where this is not, there is no help for the soul in anything else, whatever. That's where we are as a nation. We have stopped. We have been convinced that we need to be quiet when it comes to preaching the word of God. And look at the mess we're in. I applaud the, and I, I understand the separation of church and state, but those states that are trying to put the Ten Commandments back in the classrooms, I say amen. There needs to be an understanding of who God is and right and wrong. Thou shalt not kill. You may disagree with me. I love you anyway. But it's time that believers stand up and teach and preach the word of God and not back down in shame and told when we're told to hush and be quiet. We need to do it in love. But we need to proclaim the truth. Jesus went throughout all Galilee preaching the gospel and casting out demons. And he did that out of a life of prayer. Prayer and preaching is a one-two punch that cannot be defeated. And that is how the kingdom marches on anywhere and any time. The preaching of God's word is still powerful and needed today. Listen to what Paul told Timothy. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And that the man of God may be complete. Thoroughly equipped for every good work. So he said, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Who will judge the living and the dead. It is appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort. With all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. How many of you know that's where we are today? But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist and fulfill your ministry. So if God's kingdom is going to come, we must give priority to prayer. And we must preach and teach the whole counsel of the word of God and declare the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Next week there will be part two. <laughs> um, listen, every week I believe and I pray that God is working even in our midst. I want you to know something. God loves you. And he has given his word. He's given his word to lead us, to guide us. He's given his word to point us to Jesus, the only one who can save us. And if you want hope, if you want peace, if you want joy, 
look to the Word of God and look to the Lord, and you will begin to find His kingdom coming in your own life and in your own heart, and it will make a difference in the lives of those around you. Would you pray with me? Father, today, I just want to lift up that one today who may, who may say, Pastor Glenn, I don't know for certain that I know Christ. I'm not sure I've ever truly believed and repented of my sin. I want you to know that God loves you. And all you have to do is call out to Him and ask Him to forgive you. Be willing to turn from your sin and put your faith wholly and completely in the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. And He will. Lord, I pray you'll work in every heart in this place. Today, if you would like to trust Christ as your Savior, you can pray a prayer like this, meaning it with all your heart, from your heart to His. Dear Heavenly Father, You alone are God. And Lord, thank You for loving me so much. I believe you gave your son, Jesus. And I believe he died on the cross for me. Lord, forgive me of all my sins. And Lord Jesus, I believe you are the son of God. Come into my life and save me. I turn away from my sin and I want to follow you, Lord. I want to follow you. Thank you for loving me so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Maybe you prayed that prayer today and you've never done that and you know that today you meant it. 